Well, hello, and welcome to Wild Vittles. We're going to do a little bit different episode. We're, we are cooking, but we're going to do shanks. And today is asabuku, which means, I think in Italian, hole in the middle. So I've got everything ready, um, and we're going to be talking through it. So right now what I've got is oven preheating at 300 degrees. I've got a crock pot in front of me, like an enamel Dutch oven. That's what it is. Sitting in front of me with a quarter cup of olive oil in it. Heating, and it's about hot. And I've got a Ziploc bag with um, flour in it. And I've got my shanks cut already into cross sections that are, the thicker ones are probably three inches deep or long. And then I've got thinner ones that are probably four. I'm going to throw them into this baggie and uh, two at a time to be able to kind of coat them with flour. And then we're going to throw them into the crock pot and get them seared on the outside. Do this real quick. I think my pan is getting good and hot. Those two are good. These other two sections, these are from the front legs. They're just really look pretty beautiful. But you didn't see me cut these because it would have been a Jerry Springer episode of me cursing because they were a booger to cut with a handsaw. But we did it. We got it all done. So I've salted these in advance of this and let them set. And they're still, to be honest, a little bit frozen. But that was because I wanted to be able to cut them effectively and it's difficult when the meat is completely thawed. I'm getting a good coating of flour on these and I'm gonna throw them into this crock. You're gonna hear a sizzle in just a second. Well, it wasn't very dramatic. Here we go. There's a sizzle. I think the flour is just kind of help get a brown crust on them. You know, and the searing is really about kind of making a seal for the juices, keeping it all in. I'm taking it all at face value. That's how it actually works. I'm just, you know, following in the footsteps of the giants that come before me, right? All right, got this in there. I'm gonna zip up this bag of flour so I don't get it out of work, so I'm notorious for being messy with flour. In addition to these crosscut shanks, we've got, I've already cut up in advance some carrots. It was two carrots, a couple celery stalks, and an onion. And that's all sitting over here off to the side already chopped up. So what we're gonna do is when I get these shanks kind of browned, and I'm not gonna make you listen to the whole thing, we'll cut through to me getting them done. I'll take those out and then I will saute the carrots along with the celery and onions all mixed together with some dried porcini mushrooms. It called for an ounce, no, it called for half an ounce. They sell them in an ounce packet so I'm going to put an ounce in there. You do need to do some um, prep on those. You put them in a in a vessel, in a bowl, something with warm water. Let them sit for at least 20 minutes. And then rinse off the sediment. Turning these, these shanks. Now I got my pan good and hot. I had it turned up to 7 on my scale of 1 to 10. Get these good and browned. And we're going to pull those out. Saute my veggies. Then we'll, we're going to put some white wine in there to, God, what is that called when you've got the, the fond on the better, on the bottom? Um, I'm going to have to look that up during the break as to what that is, but we're going to get all the brown bits off the bottom, and then we're going to mix in uh, a little bit of chicken stock and also 28 ounces of crushed tomatoes, some thyme, as well as some oregano and some bay leaves. And this is all gonna cook for 
between two to four hours. I'll probably go closer to four hours. And it makes, you know, because shanks are tough boogers. For every hunter out there that's ever, that has ever tried to get the meat off of a shank, they will understand they are full of sinew. This dish will yield an immensely tender, tasteful, really wonderful dish. And I'm going to have to put some butcher's twine actually around these shanks to keep the meat from falling off the bone. It's that dramatic. So it makes for a beautiful presentation. I think the hardest part of this thing is cutting the shanks themselves. I'm still trying to come up with a better way to do it. Um, but all in all, not a terribly hard dish. I'm going to do this over um, risotto. And risotto is a little difficult. It just takes patience. Um, I didn't think it was too hard. I told my daughter I thought it was easy, and she thought, she said, I now will recalibrate what you think is easy and what is hard after she did it because it was a little more difficult. It just takes a lot of patience to be able to do it. So I'm going to um, continue to brown these, and we'll take a, a short break, come back when I pull these off, and we'll be putting in the vegetables. All right, the shanks are nearly brown. That went really fast. I'm gonna pull those off. They look good and browned all around, I think. I'm gonna put them back out and reserve them on the side. Now we're gonna put in the vegetables. Which again are um, a couple carrots, celery, and it's supposed to be one onion. My onion was really, really small, so I did two in there. No harm, no foul. And I need to get these softened up. So it's almost like Holy Trinity, except the Trinity doesn't have carrots. Uh, Trinity has celery, onions, and bell peppers, green or red. It's a little dry. I may have to throw a little, um, a little stock in there. Remember the term is deglaze. Is what I was trying to remember a second ago. Is there are some brown bits from browning the meat on the bottom here, and I'm going to put in some white wine in that. I would say cold, room temperature white wine hitting that hot surface will release any brown bits on the bottom of this. So this is going to take uh, six, eight minutes or so to kind of cook up and get soft. Yeah, it looks like a lot, but this will cook down to almost nothing. You won't hardly see it in the sauce. You'll, you'll act like, where were those carrots uh, by the time they get done? So while we're cooking that, a couple comments. So, if you butcher a deer, there are a lot of steps you need to take. And if you can shortcut that into taking off whole pieces without having to pull all the meat off and grind it, that much faster that you will be done. And the shanks are one of those areas. You know, the shanks are the lower sections of the legs below the, the hams and the shoulders. And what I do is, you know, I'll, I, I cut those at the joint. And you can cut them without using a bone saw. You can just use your knife around the joints. And then you just wrap that dude up. It's got a tremendous amount of sinew around it. It protects it very well. And when you wrap it up to freezer wrap it, I've never seen a shank get freezer burned, essentially, because it's got so much protective layer on it. So it's a hearty cut. It's one that you can use in multiple you know, kind of applications. And it comes out extremely tender when you braise it or slow cook it or all the above. So this is essentially a braise. I do the same thing with shoulders. I don't cut my shoulders up unless I want a flat iron steak out of it. And so that makes for really quick butchering when you're like, okay, front leg, boom, top shoulder, you know, the blade roast, middle of the arm, boom, that's a, that's a, a blade, or not a blade roast, that's an arm roast. And then you get the shank down below, do that on the other side, back legs, pull out the lower section which is the shank and you've got a tremendous amount of the deer done 
So it helps with your efficiency and it also is good application. Now this is if you like these kind of meals. The key to all of this though is how do you like to eat it? And if you would prefer to have it in burger, God bless you, have it in burger. Because it really won't do any good if you know you put it into the freezer and then you're like, I really don't like shanks. So I'm just advocating options. It is not the only way. And I've done it both ways. There's times when I'm like, I've needed a lot of ground meat. I've had some shanks left in the freezer from the year before, and I went ahead and ground them. But it's kind of a painful, arduous um, grind because there's so much sinew in there. All right, these are softening up well. I think we need a little bit more. Need to put a little salt in it. Almost forgot. I'm supposed to put my mushrooms in here too. All right, we are in good shape here. I think this is softened enough that I can probably move forward with my next step, which is going to be to pour in this white wine and to glaze the bottom. And then I'm going to need to scrape up any bits on the bottom. And it says a cup of wine, and if you use one of these little single serve, like I've got a Sutter's Home Chardonnay, and in one of these little bottles, it's not very sophisticated because it's got a screw top, but um, that one bottle is a cup. Perfectly, so I didn't need a measuring cup. So now I'm gonna scrape the bottom and make sure that I deglaze the bottom get everything that might have been deposited on the bottom there because that is where the flavor is at and it's already making a really nice kind of a sauce in the bottom in there it smells wonderful I think it's supposed to be a dry white wine I am NOT a wine expert I just know that that was a white wine so there may be a better application than what I'm doing. All right, we've poured in the white wine. We used a wooden spoon to scrape up um, the brown bits on the bottom. And then when it comes to oil, we're gonna add stock and the tomatoes and the thyme and the oregano. Ooh, I forgot that I needed to get some uh, lemon zest. So I'm gonna have to do that after all this other pieces, pieces are done. I should have said at the beginning too, this recipe comes from Hank Shaw's Buck Buck Moose uh, cookbook. So not mine, not mine, but Hank Shaw's, I'm using it verbatim. I'll link to his recipe out on the internet. The great thing about Hank is even though he sells a lot of cookbooks, all his recipes, and I think probably more than are in his books, are on the internet and everything's freely available. So gotta love the guy for that. All right, I think this is good. I'm going to put in a cup of stock. All right, this does say one cup. You should always like need to say measure twice, cut once. Well, I'm always measuring twice and making sure that I don't put too much of something into a dish because it is hard to get it out. And this isn't stock, this is broth because I can't find stock today. All right, we've put that in, and I'm going to go ahead and put in the crushed tomatoes. So I've got 28 ounces. If you can't find a 28-ounce can, you can always do two 15s, and then you just got two ounces extra of crushed tomatoes, which is perfectly fine. Let's see. Yep, we're going to add the stock, the crushed tomatoes, and then we're going to put the seasoning in here as well. And we're making a essentially a ragu sauce that the shanks are going to sit in and braise in essentially so don't panic if you're like man this seems really saucy it's going to cook down and it'll be thick 
Get in there, get in there. All right, we're gonna mix that up. And this will really darken up. It's, I know it looks like tomato soup with vegetables right now, but once it sits in there and cooks at 300 degrees for several hours, you will see a difference. I'm gonna put a teaspoon of um, thyme. Measure that out carefully. That's probably a little bit more than a teaspoon, but I'm comfortable with that. I like my flavors to be bold. A little bit of oregano. I'm using kind of the normal oregano. Often I'll use Mexican oregano. There we go. Just giving very much an Italian flavor. Get that incorporated into the sauce thoroughly. It's hard because the um, the thyme and the oregano want to float, so you need to kind of fold it into the sauce and get it distributed. All right. We got a wonderful <laughs> red sauce here. Um, a secret about me is pizza sauce makes me cough, and this is approaching <coughs> pizza sauce. <laughs> It's an involuntary thing. I can't help it. Okay, let me refer back to the menu here. We've got thyme oregano. I'm still going to put the lemon zest in. Oh, bay leaves. How many bay leaves are we going to put in there? Probably two. Teaspoon, teaspoon. Two bay leaves. It's always two bay leaves, which I find funny because bay leaves are not not a standard size to say that a leaf but it goes to show that this is an art, not an exact science. You know, there are margins for error in this, I do believe. All right, so I've got now a zest of a lemon. And so for those that are on video, what I'm holding up, I didn't know this, but I'm not as sophisticated probably, but essentially this is just lemon skin. And I'm gonna tear that into smaller pieces. And I thought, really? But when I put it in, you can actually taste it. It's pretty zesty. Um, you want to get the skin and not the pith underneath. The pith underneath is bitter. Sometimes in some applications, you'll actually take like a planer, which is like a real fine grate, and um, get some kind of little loose bits. Whatever reason, they want this to be in bigger bits. So sometimes I find it in my sauce. I don't tend to eat it. It's really intended to be kind of like a bay leaf, I think. But completely edible. So no, no harm, no foul. But like I said, the bay leaf is like the baby Jesus and the king cake. You know, it's like you should be celebrated if you find that. All right, I think we have the moment of truth here where I'm going to put in my shanks, cover it, and put it in the oven. So... I'm gonna place, I'm gonna nestle these down in here. And they're about half covered. Um, you may notice that I've got um, cooking twine, baking twine around them. And that's in hopes that I'm able to keep the meat from falling off. I'm kind of placing them symmetrically in here. So that they're evenly spaced. I want a little bit of sauce beneath them. You know, I don't want them to be touching the bottom. And then I'm going to spoon over them some of the sauce, if I can get. Because I want them all to be, all to get the love of the sauce. Short, thick ones are going to come out beautiful. The tall, skinny ones, I don't know about. They may not do as well. All right, this is ready. I'm gonna put it in the oven and I'll probably set it in there for three hours. And as it comes, before it gets ready, I'm gonna be cooking risotto and we're gonna take this out and plate it 
on a beautiful bed of risotto, risotto. So I think you've seen, and I would tell you, the hardest part of this was getting the shanks cut into sections. Do it while it's semi-frozen, get it out, let it thaw more, season them, then I've seared them, then I sauteed the vegetable mix and the mushrooms, um, put those, put some white wine in there, and um, then added crushed tomatoes and some stock and mixed it all together with a little oregano and thyme and lemon zest and you have what sits before you is a beautiful dish and now it's just time you can go off and probably when i come back i'll probably have a different set of clothes come go do a workout hit the showers come back get ready for dinner so you may think this is a lot of work i would tell you that with a little planning a little understanding it's actually not very hard and makes for a beautiful dish. Your pot will be difficult to clean though, but you can let it soak. But you know, with everything, there is a price. So we'll be back shortly and be ready to show you this beautiful dish when it's ready. Welcome back. So the asabuku has been in the oven for better part of three hours at 300 degrees. And if you remember, I put um, the twine around it to kind of hold it together. So let's see how it's holding up. See that big cloud of steam coming off that. And it's looking pretty good. The um, sauce kind of caramelizes around the edge. Uh, the meat is pulling away from the bones. It looks great. Uh, so to go with it, I have made some risotto. I did not show that process because it takes a long, long time. but. Risotto is made with a uh, special kind of rice. It's uh, the arborio rice. And you have to ladle in more and more hot uh, stock as it cooks to slowly build kind of the sauciness of the rice, if you will. And it makes a lovely thick kind of a rice. It, and it's really thick now because I've put uh, three quarters of a cup of Parmesan freshly grated Parmesan cheese in it. What I'm going to do now is I'll take a kind of a serving bowl like you would for pasta and put down some risotto underneath and put that asabuco on top with a little bit of sauce on top of that and it makes a lovely presentation. And so I know this looks and sounds extremely fancy but I can tell you that was not hard to do. Um, the hardest part was cutting those shanks and then you know just kind of mixing together essentially what is a ragu of the sauce and letting it cook and it's you know it says two to four hours depending upon the animal this was a I don't know medium-aged white-tailed buck um, all front legs um, from you know kind of cut two sections out of each front leg so you've got kind of a skinnier and a fatter one seared them seasoned them put them in with that this ragu sauce that I've made essentially and put it in the oven at 300 degrees for three hours. In the meantime, making up a, a risotto, you could do it on just regular rice. You could do it on uh, like a mashed potatoes, lots of options there. So a really great option for your shanks. And I'll just really impress upon you again, it's so much easier than trying to clean those shanks and get all that meat off and take all those tendons out and put it in the burger, make your life easier and learn to cook shanks. So I hope this has been helpful. Um, really looking forward to, to getting this one out, hearing some comments back. Have some other very interesting uh, things going on. I'm going to start. I've already done some interviews. I'm going to do some more interviews. I've got a panel discussion that I'm actually um, going to do tomorrow with a, a, some really great outdoorsmen. Um, I don't know if which order this will come out. This may actually come out after that one, but just wanted you to to know that I'm constantly thinking about what could I show, how could I improve. And I hope that you'll give me some feedback. Um, please, please, please give my podcast a rating. I really would appreciate a five-star rating because it would help people find it. You know, kind of raise it up amongst the other podcasts. Oddly enough, there are not very many wild, wild game cooking podcasts. So I'm in competition with only probably about three other podcasts. So if you'd help me compete, if you think I've, I merit that, I would appreciate that. But thank you for your participation. Hope to hear back from you. You can find me on Wild Vittles Podcast on Instagram. Wild Vittles podcast on YouTube 
And the Wild Vittles podcast is on all the podcast platforms. So thank you and good night.